Welcome to Whiskey Lore, The Interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experience in Kentucky Bourbon. And today, I'm going to be taking you back to the very roots of what is known as the Wild Turkey Distillery. Yes, before Jimmy and Eddie Russell, well, there was a family known as the Rippies. And in those old days, they were bourbon royalty. In fact, before and after Prohibition. And Tom Rippey, who is the grandson of T.B. Rippey, the man who helped make that distillery so successful, he's my guest today, and he has got a lot of stories to share. And he grew up around some of the great names in pre-Prohibition whiskey and some after Prohibition, the Bonds, the Lillards, the Downings, the Saffles. And we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about the origins of the family coming from Tyrone, Ireland, and then the little town of Tyrone and how it sort of came and went. We'll talk about Lawrenceburg before Wild Turkey and Four Roses. And we're going to talk about the preservation of the old Rippy Mansion, a home that he remembers from his youth. And we'll talk about the bourbon sessions, which is a way that they are taking in donations to try to save this beautiful Gilded Age mansion. Now, I want to send a big thank you out to Jerry Daniels of Stone Fences Tours because he was the guy that got me in touch with Mr. Rippey. And in fact, he's very involved in the bourbon sessions. So follow Stone Fences Tours or you can go on Facebook and follow the Whiskey and History community that we have set up for Whiskey Lore. And you'll be able to see when those bourbon sessions are being held. But right now, let's go ahead and jump into the interview with Mr. Rippey. He is a fascinating man. He's got great stories to share, and you're going to learn a lot about bourbon history and even feel like you're back in the middle of it. And we're going to start this interview off with him telling a little bit about his family origins and their patriarchs travel over to the United States from Tyrone, Ireland. Well, my great-great-grandfather came from County Tyrone, Ireland um, in 1831. Uh, And according to family history, uh, he came through the Port of Philadelphia and uh, worked for a wholesaler who supplied mercantile stores around the country. And eventually he moved to uh, Bourbon County, Kentucky, worked for a a merchant there, then came to what is now Anderson County. And uh, uh, in 1839, he renounced his allegiance to Queen Victoria and took his oath of citizenship in the Bourbon Circuit Court. He... uh, uh, got married the same year. Okay. And he married a lady named Artemisia Walker. The Walkers were among the first families to come to Kentucky. Mm. And her family owned most of the land uh, on b- both sides of the road between here and uh, what is now Wild Turkey. Okay. Plus some more land down in Tyrone itself, I think. But It was a marriage of uh, some profit for him (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Uh, because he married into a well-to-do family and uh, they had a couple of children and he he became basically a a wholesaler. He bought whiskey. Mm -hmm. In those days, you'd buy whiskey and it might be stored at the distillery where it was made. And he bought and sold uh, whiskey. Uh, eventually, he partnered with, I think it was his brother-in-law, mm-hmm. Monroe Walker, and another gentleman, and they built or they rebuilt a distillery in Tyrone and started to operate it, but they only operated it for about a year. Mm-hmm. And then it was sold 
to uh, my great grandfather and his partner W. H. McBrayer, who owned Cedarbrook, which is a famous uh, yeah. bourbon from yeah. here in Anderson County. And uh, he was about twenty-one when he went into the distilling wow. business. He was okay. in modern day. He would just be legal to drink. <laughs> well, uh, uh, he he. Uh, he bought out Judge McBrayer uh, after one year, mm. and he became the sole owner of the distillery in Tyrone. And he enlarged it, and enlarged it, and enlarged it. You know, most distilleries back then uh, were like an extended farm operation. They had cattle lots yeah. uh, associated with them, and which is, was true of his distillery. and. Eventually, he uh, went into partnership with uh, the owners of the Waterfall and Fraser Distillery, mm -hmm. and they built an, another distillery right next to the one that he had uh, in Tyrone. So this is uh, Cliff Springs, and the other one is uh, T.B. Rippy Distillery. I think. Was it okay? Be. Yeah. Okay. Um, he bought out the Waterfall and Fraser uh, partners. Mm -hmm. And uh, kept enlarging and enlarging and enlarging it. Supposedly, by the time he sold it, he was the largest sour mash distiller in the world. Wow. But it was a big plant for the time, very yeah. big plant. Yeah. And uh, I'm pretty sure his health was failing. He had what they call pernicious anemia, and they didn't know exactly how to treat it back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he died in Battle Creek, Michigan at the Kellogg Clinic there. Oh, wow. After a, a few years after he sold out. Yeah. In 1899. Uh, he was like a lot of people in the whiskey business. Um, he was either very rich or very poor. <laughs> Bankrupt or... Yeah. or um, a millionaire by today's a multimillionaire by today's standard. He, it sounds like he ended pretty well. Well, he ended up well enough for my great grandmother to continue to live into the house in the house that he built long after he died. Mm -hmm. She outlived him by forty-five or four some wow. odd years, and she had a staff for the house, mm -hmm. a large staff. She had a cook and maids and. Uh, yard man, and they had a butler, or you know, somebody who served the meals and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I remember him. He uh, would come to the doors between the parlor and the dining room and open the sliding doors and ring the chimes. And he would say, dinner is being served. And that was a, a signal to come in and sit down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And have dinner served. Uh, it was much more formal than it is now. Yeah. Much more formal. So that you remember that, that mansion uh, and your great-grandmother as well. Yeah, somewhere I've got a picture of myself with my great-grandmother. Yeah. It was taken down in front of the... The doors between the parlor and the and the uh, dining room, but yeah, oh yes, I remember my uh, great grandmother, and uh, uh, I remember a lot of my great aunts and uncles. Now some of them were dead before I was born, but uh, I, I knew some some of them anyway. And it was a you know it was a big extended family, and it was very comfortable. Yeah, I knew everybody on South Main Street from downtown area mm -hmm. all the way out to the cemetery. Wow. And I was kin to most of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's a lot of distilling names around this area. So, um, and you see them when you drive down the street because you see the, the street names, Bond, Saffold, as you're going along. Well, you do. Uh, and I can tell you, I, Bond, uh, W.F. Bond, was uh, my great great grandfather, and uh, his uh, daughter was uh, married uh, Jesse Johnson, 
and the Johnson house is on that bourbon trail. Mm -hmm. His son was at, opened a distillery after Prohibition. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and on the Salt River, across the river from what's now Four Roses. Across the street from where my grandparents, great-grandparents lived, uh, is Dowling Hall. Mm -hmm. And that was John and Mary Dowling. She was originally a Murphy from somewhere in western Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And he came here from Ireland. He and his brother operated a distillery in Bergen called Dowling Brothers Distilling Company. And then he uh, was part owner and eventually basically the sole owner of what is Waterfall and Fraser was Waterfall and Fraser Distillery. It was down in Tyrone as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, uh, he, all, he had interest in other distilleries around the county. And when he died, his wife, Mary Dowling, mm -hmm. was executor of his will. Now, this was before women could vote. Yeah, yeah. But she was a very shrewd business lady. And uh, she was shrewder than her sons, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, she was the one that really ran the business. Mm. Uh, she took care of the... They sold some of the distilleries that... Uh, and they kept the Waterfall and Fraser distillery. Uh-huh. Uh, and the Dowling Brothers distillery, but... The, the, some of the other the smaller distilleries they disposed of. And um, when Prohibition came along, of course, everybody had to close down. Yeah. Tyrone at that time was almost as big as Lawrenceburg. It had a city council. Wow. It had a mayor. It had a police department. It had lawyers and doctors and, you know, all that kind of stuff hotels and restaurants and whatnot. But uh, Prohibition destroyed it because nearly everybody that lived in Tyro worked in the distillery. Oh, wow. And is because, that yeah, there were Waterfall and Fraser, uh, Cedarbrook, uh, the T.B. Rippey distilleries, uh, the, the distillery on the hill, which is now Wild Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's where they were working. Yeah. And... So with prohibition, there was nothing for them to Just do. Wiped them out. So Ty Tyrone pretty much disappeared. Yeah. With prohibition, but uh, uh, Mary Dowling didn't. <laughs> okay. She uh, hired one of the beams and moved her distilling operation from Tyrone mm -hmm. to Juarez, Mexico. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I somewhere I have you know, bar trays and stuff. It says uh, Dowling, DM Distilling Company. Well, that's Dowling in Mexico, Distilling oh, Company. And she had to have a Mexican involved in the ownership, which he did. And uh, the beams operated the plant. I, was, uh, I can't remember which one of the beams, but one of the beams operated the plant for her. Mm -hmm. And they made whiskey in Mexico during Prohibition. In fact, they were still making whiskey, I know, up until the 1960s in, in war is. But I didn't, I didn't know she did. She had taken whiskey from the Dowling Distillery down in Tyrone mm -hmm. and brought it up to her house. And it was stored in the basement in gunny sacks. And uh, uh, revenue agents from Louisville uh, uh, trailed some suspected bootleggers then followed them from Louisville down to Lawrenceburg and they pulled up at the Dowling House. Well, anyway, make a short story of it. There was a raid. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they seized all of her whiskey. Wow, and I and I don't know how how many. There was over four hundred gunny sacks with whiskey in it. Mm. Anyway, quite a bit. Yeah, some arrests were made with criminal charges and everything. 
uh, uh, she was charged, but uh, her conviction was overturned on a technicality, basically. <laughs> so she did no time they, for that. But she brought suit to get her whiskey back. And she lost in the district court in Lexington. She lost in the circuit court in Cincinnati. And uh, she uh, filed for a petition, a petition for a writ of certiorari with the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But it turned it down. But she went clear to the Supreme Court. Wow. Trying to get her whiskey back. Yeah. Uh, and she was apparently quite a character. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, but she was very prominent in local uh, civic affairs. Mm -hmm. And it did a lot of good work with uh, uh, the women's groups here in town. Uh, particularly, they were very active in health concerns child health and uh, it, it was a, it, before there were uh, all the kind of service you have now we didn't have an EMS or anything like that right we had horses and buggies back mm. then <laughs> and but they had a nurse that they hired the women's group to go around the county to, to survey the county for health concerns and TB and things like that yeah and uh, she was very active in that. She was. Um, she had sons and daughters. One of them was Will Dowling, who was a, a local attorney and very successful. Uh, served in the state legislature. One of her daughters, Mary Dowling, married my great uncle Jim Bond. Mm -hmm. And they lived in the house right next to the Rippy House, which is now a funeral home, Gash's funeral home. And uh, I used to go see Aunt Mary because Uncle Jim died, in, I don't know, in the 40s. And uh, she lived, outlived him quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a real character, too, <laughs> like her mother. Yeah. Um, so those are two, the Bond and Lillard family and the Dowling family were at least united in marriage. Yeah. Uh, right next to them was the Saffle home. Mm -hmm. And W.B. Saffle had worked at Cedarbrook for Judge McBrayer. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was quite a successful businessman uh, locally. He started his own distillery called the W.B. Saffle Distillery, and it was out right off the bypass. It was located on the Hammonds Creek out there. And uh, the quality of his bourbon was quite exceptional. His daughters lived in that house, which again has become another funeral home. <laughs> uh, I don't know when they sold it, probably in the early 60s. Is that what I saw on Broadway when I was driving down? It said Saffold Funeral Home? Yes. Okay. Saffold Funeral Home. And uh, that was the W.B. Saffold Home. Uh, his daughters were, some of his daughters were living there when I grew up here in town. And I used to go over there. Mm -hmm. They had a cook who was a wonderful, she, she made the best white cake with caramel icing that I ever ate in my life. Mm. And she made that for my birthdays occasionally for me. <laughs> Very nice. And so, so I had I, I I had a particular fondness for Josephine, uh, <laughs> and I got the recipe for her icing from from one of the Saffle descendants. Mm. <laughs> so, and I was glad to get it. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, then if you move on out South Main, I guess the next house that's associated with bourbon is my grandparents' home, which is uh, E. W. Rippy. Mm -hmm. um, and my grandfather was a distiller after Prohibition. He uh, organized the Rippy Brothers Distilling Company. Was president of the distilling company until it was sold. He, he continued to work there after they sold it. Is that no, correct? His no, his son, who was also E.W. Rippey, oh, okay. uh, worked there after it. Uh, when he sold it, he retired. He 
he retired. He was racing thoroughbreds. They were never very good, but <laughs> he, he loved horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did a, you know, a little building around the town and uh, farming, mostly farming. Uh, he had farms scattered around all over the county. Uh, the first horseback ride I ever had, he took me. He was still riding, mm -hmm. and I was little. Yeah. You know, and so he put me up in the saddle with him. <laughs> uh, but but uh, he was a, was a very exceptional person, very generous person. Mm -hmm. His wife was the granddaughter of W.F. Bonds, although Bonds and Rippies got, that's how they got tangled up. Okay. And uh, uh, the house that they had there was built on some land that had been given uh, originally to her mother as a wedding present by uh, the, her, her father, W.F. Bond. And uh, there were a lot of Bond children, and every one of them, when they got married, got a gift of land somewhere or other. Mm. Uh, and uh, sometimes they uh, was land in a house. but. It, well, they were all up and down South Main Street. And uh, then right next to it was the Johnson home. My uncle Bob Johnson built a distillery uh, uh, on Salt River across from Four Roses. It was later owned by J.T.S. Brown and eventually by uh, Wild Turkey. Mm -hmm. But it's been deserted and the building caught on fire. Uh. But it was built, it was called the Bonds Mill Distillery. Uh -huh. Because it was built where there was an old mill water with a water wheel and everything. Yeah. And the distillery was built in the original building where the water wheel and everything were. Uh, and it was a very quaint little distillery. It bottled Old Joe whiskey for okay. a long time. You may know of Old Joe. Yeah. And uh, one of its famous <laughs> brands was... Joe Lewis Bourbon. Do you know who uh, Joe Lewis I, is? I'm from Detroit. I know Joe Lewis. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, they bottled Joe Lewis whiskey and mauled it, and they had a little pair of boxing gloves uh, tied to the bottles. Wow. Uh, and uh, that, that was that was part of the you know the promotion for it. Yeah. And uh, uh, Four Roses was built originally by J.T.S. Brown's sons. Okay. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah, didn't okay. know that. Yeah. And it was it was actually known as the, was it known as the Old Prentice Distillery first or the Old Joe Distillery? It was the Old Prentice Distillery. Old Prentice Distillery. Prentice. Okay. Now, I don't know how, but, and maybe you do, I, I don't know. Yeah. But Agnes Fiddler Brown ended up with title to the distillery and the mansion behind it. Mm. Okay. She had married one of the Brown sons. Mm -hmm. And they they were all in the distillery together, but she how she ended up with it I don't know. Yeah, and this is the what is now the Four Roses distillery. Was now the Four Roses. Yeah. That's when it opened after prohibition. She had gone in to make an arrangement with the distiller here called, uh, his name was Gratz Hawkins, mm -hmm. uh, a descendant of Granville Bourbon Hawkins. Mm. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Love the nicknames, yeah. Yes. So, so, but he was doing Old Joe down on uh, Gilbert's Creek Road. Mm. And uh, he was going to do Old Joe at what's now the Four Roses Distillery. Yeah. And so he moved in, and they organized a corporation. They sold, you know, stock in it. I have a certificate of, for preferred stock in it that's worth mm. only what the papers were. <laughs> but, but the problem was uh, Gratz hadn't uh, registered the trademark. And another distillery, I think it was up somewhere up in New England, registered the trademark and bought a trademark <sighs> action against him. Wow. So, and he lost 
So they couldn't do old Joe there anymore. Yeah. And she sold the distillery. Mm. And uh, then it went through several hands. Seagram's had it for a long time. And then, of course, it ended up when Seagram's was basically dissolved. Yeah. Uh, it ended up with a... Uh, uh, Japanese. Karen, yeah. Karen, Karen Brewing Company. Yeah. In Japan owns it now. It's interesting to see how... Well, I, what I find fascinating is the JTS Brown name bouncing from place to place because it was actually... Was it at the... Um, Distillery where Wild Turkey is now, there was a distillery there. Did they do, was that called JTS Brown well, Distillery oh, for some time? Oh, yes. But after, when my grandfather sold it, mm -hmm. he sold it to the Gould Brothers from Cincinnati. Okay. Now, uh, uh, they were a Jewish family. They had some connections with Shenley. Okay. And Shenley, my grandfather had a contract with Shenley to sell it. Whiskey and uh, uh, Old Rippy back then was all uh, made and bottled for Shanley, mm. basically. They bought it, and they had the JTS Brown name. Okay. When they bought it, and they it became their their major distillery then. Mm. Um, and uh, they bought several other distilleries. They bought. What, what had been the Bonds Mill Distillery. They bought what had been the Dowling Brothers Distillery, I think, up in uh, Bergen. Um, I mean, you know, they owned uh, several, several distilleries. Yeah. Um, but yes, it had been J.T.S. Brown. It was sold then by J.T.S. Brown, uh, and it became Wild Turkey then. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because you still there still was a Rippy Brothers distilling at the same time that there was that Wild Turkey came in. Is that not because who was making Ezra Brooks? Ezra Brooks was being made at Hoffman Distilling. Company. Hoffman Distill. Okay. Okay, and Hoffman was a Rippy Brothers. My two two of my great uncles uh, uh, owned and operated it. Uh, that was Ezra Fiddler and my uncle uh, Robert or Bob Johnson. Okay. And Bob Johnson, Bob Rippey. Yeah. Uh, that was on 44. Julian Van Winkle was bottling uh, down there until, I don't know, the early 2000s. Mm. Okay. Sometime. I mean, I'm not sure exactly when he closed. 2001, 2002. That's the Hoffman, two. the Hoffman distillery you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. That, 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 but he was bottling his, his product down there. Okay. But uh, that, they, that's where Ezra Brooks started. Yeah. And so in following the JTS Brown name, which comes out of the George Garvin Brown, Brown Foreman uh, family, and now has kind of popped off into its own... Um, space now it's with Heaven Hill, I think is who, who has it now. So, um, but it's interesting that when you sell off something that has your name on it, how all of a sudden legally it becomes tougher to put out another product because uh, with with your name on it. Because Ezra Brooks, the story I hear behind that is that uh, Brooks wasn't really a family name or anything like that, but the Ezra did come. From the family. Well, see, I said my uncle Ezra was one of the partners in Hoffman. Yeah, and so it's his name, and then Brooks. Any idea where that came from? Well, they were looking for something other than Fiddler, I think. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I mean, it's just something that's a little snappier than Fiddler. Yeah. So this area, when you were young. It must have just been a landscape of distilleries. Well, uh, all this area back here was farmland. Okay, so all those old distilleries that went at Prohibition, the buildings just disappeared over time? or uh, Well, the only ones that reopened what had been the old Prentice plant as Dow Four Roses. Yeah. Uh, the Rippy Brothers distillery that's still on the hill, which is now Wild Turkey. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Hoffman. Okay. Those were the only three that opened up. Now, my Uncle Bob 
basically built the new distillery in what had been the Bonds Mill, uh, you know, grain mill. Yeah. But that was the new distillery. It, wasn't what, it didn't exist before uh, Prohibition. So what was Lawrenceburg like then when you were growing up? Did it feel like a place that was that had lost its its history and, and um, was kind of just... No, it hadn't lost its history because so many people were still living. Yeah. That had grown up before World War One. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit older than you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I I knew people who had had uh, been in World War One. I. I knew a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there were there was a vast difference in the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, for one thing, it was much smaller. The the people who had been in the distilling business were still pretty well to do, and they lived mostly along South Main Street. Mm-hmm. There was a, uh, I think, a closeness which comes from being a very small community. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, everybody knew everything you did for one thing, <laughs> and if you were young, you had to be very careful that you didn't get in trouble. Because if you got in trouble, your parents found out pretty quick. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> to remember too, I, when I was young at least, I could walk down the street and not see a car. Mm. I might see a horse and buggy. Yeah. But, you know, during World War II, all the plants were under the supervision of the War Production Board and they were all producing stuff for the federal government. Well, all the distilleries here were too. Yeah. They were producing alcohol for the military. And it was used in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, explosive devices and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, it, it, so it was really quite different. You had mail delivery twice a day. Let's see, I think it cost a penny for a postcard <laughs> and three cents to mail a letter. Wow. Now, um, now you just lick a dollar bill and stick it on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it was very different. Yeah. But, well, when I was at least, when I started to school, uh, Monday was saving stamps day. And the kids all brought their money and you bought saving stamps. After you got so many saving stamps, you turn your saving stamp book in and get a, a, a bond. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was somebody say Monday was saving stamps day. Uh, everything was rationed. Um, and they had scrap drives. Um, and uh, a lot of people were still using an ice box. Do you know what an ice yeah, box is? Yeah, I know what an ice box <laughs> is. Yeah. Well, my grandparents had an ice box. Oh, okay. My, well, one set of my grandparents did, and uh, the ice man would come a couple of times a week and deliver blocks of ice, mm. so that they could keep their ice box cold. Uh, and it, it was just a different time altogether. Yeah. Uh, a very different time. You you were living almost in this area then, some elements of the really early 20th century uh, in terms of uh, if you're still seeing horse and buggy going down the the road and uh, well, that, you know, because there, there are several reasons for it. One of which was they didn't make any cars during World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second was even before World War II. A lot of people didn't have a car. Yeah. And finally, uh, gas and tires were rationed. Mm. Now, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was a physician. And he got a special allowance. Because back in those days, you didn't have an emergency management system Mm -hmm. to take people to the hospital. And... A lot of the medical practice was done at their home. And he was the youngest doctor in town during World War II. Now, he was a World War I veteran. Okay. But he was the youngest doctor practicing medicine here because the, the very young ones were in the military. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just, it was very different. 
you didn't see TV news because there wasn't any such thing. Yeah. Uh, we had our equivalent for it was called uh, Path A News. Do you know what that is? I've heard the uh, name before, but I'm not RKO sure. RKO exactly. Path A News. Okay. It was, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 It's kind of like a radio or a film reel at the it was movie? A, it was a film reel at, at the movie. Okay. And that was the closest thing you had to, to uh, you know, to a, a TV kind of news. Yeah. Um, if you listen to the news on the radio, which most people did back then, uh, that was the way you got your news, that mm-hmm. and reading the newspapers. Yeah. Uh, but uh, people didn't have so many diversion. Yeah. Kids didn't play on cell phones and iPads and whatever <laughs> they got. Yeah. What you played with was your imagination a lot. And you made, or at least we made, our own toys mm-hmm. out of whatever it might be, tobacco sticks or whatever. <laughs> but, you you know, you made your own toys. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of things like we'd t- go hiking. Mm-hmm. One of our favorite hiking spots was called Panther Rock, which was out in the county. There were all kinds of stories about the panther back then. <laughs> <laughs> to, to but, <laughs> try to scare you into not going up there. But it was basically where uh, there was a... Uh, a cliff, mm-hmm. uh, a limestone cliff, and it was sheer. And at the bottom, there was a cave, mm. and a stream that ran out of the cave, and the water was cold and clear. And um, we camp at the top, and uh, you could go down, and well, you could. I guess you could drink the water. We did, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're still here to tell about it. So, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> so yeah. So yes, it was. It was. It was very different than the kind of life you have today. Yeah, yeah, and you kind of had to invent your own uh, your own fun, and uh, and, and there's there's. The part of me that goes all this technology is making us smarter but in a way it's making us less what we refer to as street smart you're you're not actually getting out and doing things you're just book learning basically off the internet so well i think it's uh my feeling about education is that it should stimulate your thought Mm -hmm. and rote learning doesn't do that yeah and I think with the technology, what we're getting is more rote learning, and it doesn't it doesn't stimulate the brain cells very much. Well, and the other thing is, it's, nobody really wonders anything anymore. We all can get the answer in two seconds off of Google. So, <laughs> it's, well, you get an answer, an not answer, the yeah. answer. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and there is a difference. Yeah. So thinking back to. Um, the stories you may have heard about uh, prohibition and what was going on there. We hear these fantastic tales of, uh, you know, they always focus on the mafia and Al Capone and all that sort of stuff that was going on. What were some of the stories that were more local that you would have been hearing about here? Well, uh, uh, warehouses at the Rippy plant mm-hmm. down in, uh, Tyrone uh, were robbed mm. uh, by there was basically a large group of people mm-hmm. and they packed up trucks and everything and headed off with whiskey mm. now I think they caught them on their way to Chicago yeah but uh, uh, you, you did I mean there were cases of that sort of thing uh I told you about Old Joe. Yeah. Uh, Back when I was working as a lawyer, I had a a situation where I had to look at the reasons for the expulsion of a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a case brought to expel him, actually. I think he resigned. Mm. But his name was 
Langley, and he was from Pikeville, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was cu accused of violating the Volstead Act, which is the prohibition law. Yeah. Uh, and so I was reading he had lost in the lower courts, and there was an appeal to the Supreme Court. And I was reading the records and briefs of the case, and uh, there's a transcript of the of the testimony in the uh, trial court. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading along, and I see Gratz Brown Hawkins is a witness. He was president of Old Joe. He was, uh, he was, okay. We talked about him earlier yeah, yeah. being in partnership with Agnes Fiddler out here. Yeah. And uh, but I knew the Brown. I, you know, I I knew the Hawkins family. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in fact, they were close neighbors of ours down in South Maine. And uh, so, of course, I was interested. Well, it turns out that among the uh, whiskeys he was alleged to have bootlegged, uh, uh, one of them was Old Joe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so wow. That's why. Great. Gratz was called to testify. Oh, wow. So, yes, there were some situations during Prohibition where people in Anderson County were involved in mm. one way or another. <laughs> some, of, some of the things that were going on. Yeah. Uh, but I'll tell you what, one of the Saffle ladies, and that was her name was Allie, or Lal is what grandmother always called her. She was a delightful person. And she said, I could have told them prohibition wasn't going to work as long as I had a percolator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I said she was saying that in jest. I yeah, think. But, yeah. But, she was right. But, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, we just need her up talking to Congress and get that all uh, figured out. <laughs> oh, listen, I tell you, she could have set some straight, all right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm an avid crossword puzzle worker mm -hmm. and I started working crosswords with her younger sister Todd Bartlett who was one of W.B. Savile's daughters as well mm -hmm. because she subscribed to the New York Times and would do the New York Times Sunday crossword mm -hmm. and she'd bring it up to my grandmother's up here and they'd all work on it together and I get to the point where I like to work on it with them and uh, and that that got me started. And I mm -hmm. I continue to this day. I I subscribe to the Lexington Herald newspaper because it has the New York Times crossword. In it. Oh, okay, <laughs> Keep, keeps the mind going. I think it helps. Yeah, it helps. yeah, absolutely. So, are you shocked at all that after because Bourbon went through a long time period where it really was just selling to the loyal customers but it really had kind of lost its popularity and is now everywhere it's like it's it's just exploding right now does it surprise you how much it's caught on again well uh, I think uh, it's like everything else uh, liquor goes through cycles mm -hmm. and uh, that was this was one of the this was one of the cycles, and right now it's very good for the bourbon. Yeah. How long it will last, I can't say. <laughs> uh, it was hard for me to believe, because I grew up in a bourbon family, mm -hmm. that it was ever, ever out of mm. fashion. I learned to make a Manhattan from my grandmother, huh. because her bridge group, which included a couple of <laughs> the Saffle girls, would have bridge every Friday afternoon. And after bridge was over, at five o'clock, they had Manhattans. And so I was the bartender for a while. <laughs> and how old were you when you were? I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. I, but I started in the distilling business quite young. Yeah. Uh, I was not quite three, mm. when I first went to work out at Rippy Brothers in Warehouse A of what's now Wild Turkey. There's a picture of me 
and I probably had on a diaper still, <laughs> sitting sitting on the uh, uh, barrel run. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Get to the early was, start. Yeah, this was before World War II, so. Wow. You know, yeah, it was early. Yeah, yeah. So do you still have a relationship with, with wild turkey? Do you, and, and did you through the years? Uh, it's been off and on. Yeah. It's been off and on. Yeah. Uh, I I like to keep a, uh, a good relationship with all the bourbon people. Yeah. Uh, and that include I loved Al Young. I don't know if you know Al Young or uh, He not. was my first interview, and he died a <laughs> month after that interview, and I had so many more questions <laughs> I wanted to ask him. Well, Al Young was a wonderful person. Yeah. And one of my favorite people in the industry. Of course, he's with Four Roses. And uh, uh, yes, and uh, and I have some friends that work at different distilleries around. Uh, I have no, no, well, I have a number of other friends that work out at Four Roses. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I keep up with it, and uh, I try to uh, I try to taste different bourbons. Yeah. Uh, and there's some I like better than others. I put it that way. Do you do you have a, a current favorite or? Uh uh well i i think dollar for dollar the the it's kind of hard to beat just wild turkey 101 yeah dollar for dollar yeah uh but uh heaven hill has one out that i think is pretty good and they make the henry mckenna and the mckenna is an excellent bourbon yeah uh so i yeah i, I say i taste them all yeah uh, and we're uh, we're fortunate. We've had a lot of very interesting people come to the old house, um, including members of the Beam family and and others uh, to talk to us. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I well, really have. So, so just talk about that uh, a little bit. Where did the idea? Um, come up to start doing these bourbon sessions to save the house? Well, uh, well we uh, when we bought the house we didn't buy it to live in mm-hmm. but we wanted it to be rather a, a community asset. So we've been trying to do things to promote it as mm-hmm. a community asset and this was the outgrowth of uh, our desire to because it's it's a beautiful place. I don't know if you've been inside it not or yet. not. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it's really it's uh, it's a it's a work of art. It's mm-hmm. not just a house. Mm-hmm. The stained glass in it is beautiful. Uh, the woodwork is unbelievable. I mean, even the door hinges. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Take a look at them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. You won't see door hinges like that anymore. Well, and you won't see doors that tall anymore either. Yeah. Uh, and this was this was built in the eighteen seventies, eighties. Eighteen eighty. It okay. was finished in eighteen eighty eight. Okay. It cost eighty five thousand dollars to build it in eighteen eighty eight. Oh, wow. Which so is, that was a lot of money in eighteen eighty eight. Yeah. And translated into today's dollars, it's in the millions. But um, it is a beautiful. It's a beautiful place. The, the the woodwork is a lot of it is mahogany mm-hmm. mm. and you couldn't replace it now you can't get the Philippine mahogany anymore yeah uh, and uh, then uh, there's cherry and walnut and oak as well um, and uh, the plaster work uh, and when we bought it a lot of that plaster was on the floor was it so, uh, it, how long was it out of the Rippey family hands? It was sold in 1965. Okay. And my father had some interest in buying it. Mm-hmm. And my mother said, you could, as long as I have a staff as big as Ma'am Rippey. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, put, that put the kibosh on yeah. the idea of yeah. buying the house. She said, no, I can't, there's no way... I can take care of that house in that yard. <laughs> okay. 
When he built that house, TV must have been in one of his very prosperous times then. Well, he, it, it, I understand it, it didn't all get built in a day. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, there were times when they had to stop because there wasn't any money. But um, shortly after he fin- finished the house, I know he was bankrupt again. Wow. And that was back... Uh, I was trying because there was a whole idea of having a distillers association. He was part of the group of of distillers who put the idea, you know, together, Mm -hmm. and was on the group that drew up the proposals for it. Along with Colonel Colonel Taylor, then he disappeared. He wasn't part of it, Uh, and the reason was he didn't have any money anymore. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I have somewhere a letter he wrote to uh, the Bank of Springfield, Kentucky, uh, wanting to settle his debts with them with barrels of bourbon. (laughs) He had barrels of bourbon, but he didn't have any money. Well, well, that that was the bartering uh, chip in the in probably fifty years before that time. Well, his 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 uh, father supposedly had bought the. A farm out here on the highway. It's now a big subdivision, but yeah, he bought it with whiskey. Yeah, that was just you know that was that was currency. Yeah, it was currency. So yeah, I am looking forward to to seeing this. How long have you been doing the bourbon sessions? Well, we started about I guess three years ago. Four. Okay. We had to take a break because of the virus. Yeah. Yeah. But we've we've had, uh, as I say, we've had some very good people. We're trying to do other things as well. We had a concert pianist come and play in the house, and it was a benefit for Alzheimer's Association. Mm. Uh, and we're trying to do things for the community as well. For the community as, as, yeah. as well. Yeah. We just had the church that's nearby. The Christian church was right there. They had a picnic on the lawn, mm. like I guess last weekend, I think. Yeah. Uh, so we're trying to make it available to people. That's that's great, and that's being from Detroit originally, and around that city, what still standing there from when it was the they called it the Paris of the West, back when the automotive industry was really kicking up, and they built all those beautiful Art Deco buildings down there. And I think people go down there and they, they don't get a chance to appreciate that because they're busy on their way to this or that or they've come to town for some some other reason. But, you know, towns like Louisville, Cincinnati, the architecture of those towns from that late 1800s era is, to me, some of the most beautiful uh, some of the most beautiful designs and also a lot of detail in those designs. So when you're talking about that house being built that way, it really was the way people were thinking back then is let's let's build something grand. Yeah, it's times have changed. Times change, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time. Well, you're more than welcome. I hope it's useful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> And if you want to learn more about the Bourbon Sessions and seeing the T.B. Rippy Mansion, just head to tbrippyhome.com. That's Rippy spelled R-I-P-Y. And for Whiskey Lore show notes, transcripts, hoodies, tasting kits, or links to Whiskey Lore's social media, just head to whiskey-lore.com. And if you're enjoying these interviews, make sure to tell a friend about Whiskey Lore the interviews and help the show grow. I'm your host, Drew Hennish. Have a great week, and until next time, cheers and slanjava. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC.